All right, thank you all for coming. I'd like to welcome you to the partnership session. I'm the convener. My name is Rhys Francis. I'm the Associate Director for Strategy and Partnerships of the Biocommons. I'd like to start by acknowledging country. I acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. I recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. We have a pretty packed agenda and quite a few people to speak, so I might just move straight into the introduction. The Australian Biocommons, the place where the partnerships that advance Australia's bioinformatics infrastructure can form and grow. I've cut, the, cut and pasted an image there from our website and they're our partners. I thought I might talk about why they're there. If we were the NCI or PAUSI and we handed out a quota of compute power to researchers and then ask the question, which institutions did we help? We could have a very long list of partners, couldn't we? But we don't do that. That's not why they're there. If we were the ARDC and ran funding programs for a variety of reasons, and then ask the question, who did we help? Probably every university would be there. But we don't do that. We're not funded to do that. That's not why they're there. So why are our partners our partners? It's a very good question, isn't it? It turns out if we want to deliver advanced bioinformatics techniques to vastly more researchers in Australia, something has to change about the digital infrastructure that makes that possible. It's currently not there and not there being used for that purpose today. So part of the reason we have our partners is to actually achieve our impact. They're essential to us. If we don't work with them, we can't succeed. If we work with them and change and increase the value of the digital infrastructures in Australia to life science research, we succeed. Our partners are there for that reason. And you can look at them and see that. They do something more for us. I think Andrew said yesterday that three years ago, the Biocommons was an idea in a few people's heads. Today, it's an idea in hundreds of people's heads and in a few years, thousands. What we see when we look at those logos are people who confront the reality of the problem we're trying to solve, the opportunities we're trying to gain. And each of those logos represents a leader in science or a leader in informatics or a leader in infrastructure. It's come to join the Biocommons and work on our mission. It's their thought leadership that is going to define us, not the idea we had three years ago. So our partners are crucial to the Biocommons. They deliver our impact, they amplify our value enormously, and collectively they confront every issue we need to deal with, and their leadership is trying to solve those issues. And their leadership is our thought leadership and their thought leadership is going to define what we do in the future. It's a fantastic journey, and it's brilliant that all these parties are coming with us, and we are very grateful. We have partners that appoint the staff that make the Biocommons what it is. The core hub team has four employers, but you wouldn't know that. The team works seamlessly. It's just a group of people doing the job. We have partners that participate in Bring Your Own Data project trying to do the productivity boost for bioinformatics on major digital resources. And in 10 years time, all major digital resources will need to be bioinformatics ready. We have partners in our human genome initiative, creating new capabilities for medical research missions and one day all medical research missions. We have partners that develop and operate Galaxy Australia, an expansive, reliable research serving infrastructure any researcher in the country can simply log in and use today to do their bioinformatics now. We have partners that support efforts to deploy compute power in new ways, you know, providing digital resources to communities rather than research projects. It's amazing, isn't it, that that's a new idea. We have partners at the international level. You heard about that yesterday in Europe through our collaboration strategy with Lixer, a broad range of partners. In the US, more through our technology arm, through Galaxy and Gen 3 and Seven Bridges. We have partners who are other national infrastructures, all of the rest of BPA, but all of the national digital infrastructures, not PAUSI or just NCI or one or the other, every single one of them deeply engaged in what we're doing. 
And we're extending that now to some of the data investments like the Atlas of Living Australia. We'll have a new service with them being built next year. And then we'll move into the phenotyping investments. They'll become our partners too. And what's coming? Well, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, we're going to open the door to commercial cloud infrastructures. We honestly don't know what that means, but we have to do it. And we're going to do it and we are doing it. And you'll see it happen next year. In the future, we imagine a vastly larger number of participants in the things we care about. Population scale, human genomics and precision medicine. To be honest, unless we all put our shoulder to the one wheel, we're going to take a long time to get there. It is a very big challenge. And comparative genomics in agriculture and environment, just the same. A very large amount of data from a lot of different places with different techniques has to be brought together to do comparative genomics well. And that's our partnership story. We cannot possibly discuss that in detail in just 40 minutes. It's not possible. So what we're going to do is just have a few examples. And I'm going to move to the first example now. So I'm going to ask Nigel Ward and Anna Simon, Gareth Price and Simon Gladman to turn on your videos and probably unmute your microphones. Nigel's the Associate Director for Platforms in Australian Biocommons. Anna works in Galaxy, but is a, in fact a senior bioinformatician at the University of Melbourne. Gareth Price, one of the leaders of our Galaxy team, is actually the head of computational biology at QFAB Bioinformatics. Simon Gladman, another leader of our team, is a senior research fellow at the University of Melbourne. This is what we mean by we're a set of partners in a partnership. What I'm going to do is stop scaring, sharing my screen, Nigel, and pass over to you. Thanks, Rhys. I'm hoping uh, we can see the panel, panel now. So welcome to the panel. Um, we thought we would save you death by slideshow and we're just going to have an informal chat about the partnerships that underpin Galaxy Australia over a range of, range of topics over the next 20 minutes or so. Um, the first topic I'd like to cover is the partnerships that, that helped underpin the transition of Galaxy Australia into a national service over the last 10 years. We've actually been at this over, for 10 years, Gareth, it's amazing. Um, I first became aware of Galaxy Australia in 2011 when I was Deputy Director for Platforms within the Nectar Project. And uh, the, Gal the Genomics Virtual Laboratory was a, a, one of the virtual laboratories funded by that project. At the time, it had a vision to um, make it easier for researchers to deploy their own Galaxy instances on the newly developed National Research Cloud. Fast forward to 2021, and we've got a slightly different service. We were actually running a single national Galaxy service for a range of users uh, and operated by a range of partners. Um, Gareth, you've been around for much of that journey. So I, I want to throw to you to see if you can comment about what happened along the way. How's the team grown? What partners have come in to really support that transition? Thank you, Nigel. Um, and, and thank you for your credit there. I think my connection to Galaxy as a user goes back about eight years ago to its very early days. My connection to it as part of this team has been five years now. And when that connection started, and I really want to emphasize it started from a positivity base. So absolutely what Reese said was right. You know, we're a coalition of the willing, we're a collective group of people that want to achieve the same outcome. So uh, through our funding streams, uh, I guess it was recognized that GVLs were being utilized around the country. To a certain extent though, they were being utilized by people already skilled in command line to spin up a, a virtual lab, to understand how to resource it on their infrastructure. What we're seeing on the other hand was our partner organizations. And for me, that was QCIF at the time, delivering training and doing that through the, the rare public Galaxy services we had in Australia, which was Galaxy Melbourne, Galaxy Tutorial and Galaxy Queensland. Uh, and the glass half empty view, which is definitely not where we're at now, was each of those services was slightly divergent with different control mechanism, different access mechanisms, different data longevity, uh, different tool sets. And, and really what we needed to do 
uh, was to pull all of that together and to make the, the total greater than the sum of the parts. And that's where very quickly, and I, I must admit extremely personally satisfyingly again, the teams gelled almost immediately, not without effort, but gelled very quickly because they had that common driver to, to take Galaxy uh, from the product, from the global product Galaxy, take it from the local product, the GBL, and expose it uh, in a routine and uniform manner nationally. That's what I remember of the journey, and it definitely, in its early days, was University of Melbourne and QCIF, Nectar, ARDC, and, and it has grown to, you know, as Reese again hinted, a, a much, much larger collection of partners that support us now. Um, but in terms of the historical journey, I think maybe thrown to Simon uh, for, for his recollection of how we brought that together. It's probably a nice segue. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I think the, the really important part for us and the biggest change that occurred over the last few years is um, our expansion to running jobs from more than a single site. Uh, originally, Galaxy Melbourne ran all jobs on Melbourne University um, infrastructure in Queensland. Um, uh, Galaxy Queensland ran all on University of Queensland infrastructure. And when we amalgamated um, the, the two servers into one, we had a, a resource going begging in Melbourne that we weren't using. And so um, I was lucky enough to go to a Galaxy community conference and I saw a talk on, on Pulsar, which is uh, was then uh, Galaxy's brand new remote job runner. And uh, the US were using it to send some of their more problem problematic Galaxy jobs from their home base in Texas to the University of Indiana um, and, and get them run there. And then they it would return back to the home Galaxy again. And I thought, wow, this is something we can really use in Australia because um, we can, um, for starters, if we I add Galaxy Melbourne's resource into Galaxy Australia, we can double our resource overnight almost. And so fast forward um, to now, and that idea of using Pulsar remote compute nodes has allowed us to create a truly nationally distributed um, service and uh, incorporating resources from uh, people like um, uh, Pawsey, uh, NCI, Arnet, University of Melbourne, QCIF, Melbourne Bioinformatics, University of Queensland, and uh, soon heaps and heaps of others. And so that was just one of the examples that our, our um, international collaborations have really uh, paid off because <laughs> it's just suddenly we've gone from a, a single site to spread out all across the country. Thanks, thanks Simon and Gareth. Um, that, that, that's a nice connection to another topic I'd like to talk about, talk about is the, the partnering of the backend resources that now underpin Galaxy Australia uh, through that Pulsar, Pulsar network. Um, it's worth noting that Galaxy Australia now runs at some serious scale. I think we've got about 15,000 registered users, Gareth, about 500 active per month. Uh, we run regular national training courses. Um, is it right you've just done the three millionth or two millionth, which one? Three millionth? Yeah, three millionth. Sorry, three we millionth. cut each other off. Yep. Three millionth job. So that all takes some serious back end grunt. Um, Simon, are you able to tell us where the service runs now and what, what facilities and, and maybe describe the, what those facilities add to the service as well? Yeah. So as I kind of mentioned before, we've using um, Galaxy and its uh, remote job runner Pulsar, we've managed to spread out Galaxy Australia to pretty much the whole country now. Um, and we have uh, nodes at um, Pawsey, at Arnet, NCI, um, QCIF, um, University of Melbourne, and we've got over a, over a thousand cores now. Um, the the Pawsey uh, node runs our core service and there's about 200 cores dedicated to that. And all the rest of our resource comes from the distributed remote runners and, and each um, node offers, a, uh, um, offers something different and um, we use it for, for different purposes. So for example, um, at NCI, um, we've been given a lot of scale there and that's ideal for training because we can um, scale out our resource at that location. And then um, we can use our scheduler to send trainee jobs to NCI. And that allows us to run really large workshops where every student basically can run their job at the same time. Cause I really don't want to be sitting around waiting till, you know, overnight or something if in a three hour workshop to run a job. So um, yeah, that, that has been really 
a fantastic addition. Um, the other ones are things like the high memory nodes based at the University of Melbourne and University of Queensland, where they're perfect for things like Anna was talking about before, the large genome assemblies. And um, yeah, we, we can uh, selectively send jobs to those as well. And then all of the other nodes that we run um, at the University of Melbourne and um, at Arnett and at um, Queensland and in um, NCI, we use those for general uh, capacity, so for overflow capacity. So when our core service at Pawsey is flat out, we can easily send more jobs off to the other locations. And so each of the each of the partners have come along with uh, different resources, different infrastructures, but we've managed to um, uh, optimize their use for, for different purposes, which is really, really cool. And um, in the future, we're well coming up very soon, we're planning on uh, expanding that out to uh, commercial cloud and um, especially for use of um, some uh, um, specialist equipment like um, GPUs, et cetera. And um, so we're partnering with a bunch of people uh, like Azure and AWS, et cetera, to make that happen. And uh, the whole idea of us doing this is so that um, uh, the researchers don't have to. Um, you don't have to have an application for NCI or an application at Pawsey. You can just log into Galaxy because we've done all that already. So, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, Anna, I'd like to bring you into the conversation now, maybe talk a bit about community use of Galaxy and the kind of science partnerships that underpin some of our collaborations. Um, so you're a bioinformatician working at the University of Melbourne. Um, in the last session, you mentioned that comprehensive guide that you're developing for assembling large genomes in Galaxy. Um, I'd be interested in your views on how science communi communities can partner with Galaxy. Yeah, so I was having a bit of a think about this, and I, I think it, um, it's a sort of a topic that extends to um, communities from size of sort of, even if it's just a single researcher or a small group of researchers, um, all the way to large research groups working on sort of coordinated large projects. And I think Galaxy is really supportive of, of any of those sizes of science communities. And it welcomes um, joining any of those groups because it really has the resources to um, run the analyses that I think each of those groups would require. So um, yeah, we've been working on, we've, we've sort of prioritized this work on uh, large genome assembly training and tools and the associated high memory compute that science was, um, Simon was talking about. Um, because this is such a current topic in the research landscape in Australia. A lot of people working on large genome assemblies. Some of them are single individuals, some of them are medium-sized groups, and some are consortia. So we want to support all of those people to do their research. Um, uh, um... Yeah, the last session you mentioned that the large genome assembly tutorial has led to improvements in Galaxy. Um, my observation is that that um, that there's kind of been a translation role for bioinformaticians such as yourself in helping bring scientists on to to deal with that. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, definitely. So in working on that sort of tutorial. Um, one of the things that I would do is actually try and run the types of analyses uh, and tools that a person assembling a genome might also do. So I could sort of try it out first, work out um, if there were bugs, report that to the Galaxy team who are always so helpful in troubleshooting those issues, um, can start to think about um, just even improving the interface that the user would interact with in Galaxy. So can we sort of improve this um, documentation around the tool wrapper that's displayed to the user. Um, do some tools need to be sent to these high memory nodes because they either don't work on a, a smaller node or they just really need to, to run on the high memory node for sort of time reasons. Um, so running through all those steps means that um, can iron out a lot of those problems and that really just increases the efficiency of the process, I suppose. It's, I think, Simon, you were saying this before too. We, we do those things and then it, does, it doesn't have to be that 10 or 100 different individuals have to go through the same process. So hopefully we can really increase the efficiency um, with which people can use this sort of infrastructure. Thanks, Anna. And um, uh, 
another partnership we have is with international science communities as well. I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little about a bit about the work you've been doing with the Vertebrate Genomes Project. Yeah, so I guess that's a good link between yeah individual researchers to medium-sized groups to really international large groups. So there are a lot of people working on genomes um, all over the world. Um, some are working on particular taxonomic groups. Um, so there's a group working on the Vertebrate Genome Project, which is an initiative to uh, assemble a genome for every species of vertebrate, which is a huge number of genomes. So they're going through the process now of trying to work out um, some of the best ways to do that so that they can sort of run in batch mode, I suppose, down the track. So at the moment, they're, they're trying a lot of tools, finalising the best workflows. Well, I should say the best workflows for now, because these things always change, which is only a benefit really for the results. So they've been working on a lot of workflows that Galaxy has implemented, um, at least some, some of them. And Galaxy Australia has been testing these out, um, installing the tools and trying to ultimately make them available to Australian researchers. And I suppose just tying back to some of the other things I was talking about in, in general with um, a topic such as large genome assembly, we wanna take these uh, range of workflows for large genomes that exist internationally, and we wanna gain the maximum use of them, provide them to um, Australian researchers, but also give them the skills to customize them, to interchange them with other workflows or with new tools in particular. So yeah, I think that's a good example of how we're, again, with that idea of really increase, increasing efficiency by um, not redoing things that have, someone has already done, but tapping into that and making use of it. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Um, Simon and Gareth, uh, you also partner internationally more on the infrastructure side as part of the, the Global Galaxy Initiative. Um, I'm wondering if you could describe some of your interactions with that community, uh, the value it brings to Galaxy Australia, but also maybe the value that we contribute back to that, to that partnership. Yeah, um, sure. We're, we're, Galaxy Australia is part of what we call the usegalaxy.star collaboration, which is um, a, collabor a collaboration between uh, the four or five really, really large public galaxy servers in the world. And um, we share a lot of things um, uh, amongst ourselves and with the other rest of the galaxy communities and other people who run servers. And m most of them are around, um, uh, we have a big um, shared reference data network. So um, we everybody gets access to the same reference data. It's all um, served out automatically, etc. Um, we share a lot of tools. Um, we we share a, a lot of ideas about how to run our, our systems as well. But we also um, contribute back to the um, to that collective. And Gareth, if you can talk about the uh, a couple of those ones that we have done recently. Thanks, Simon. Um, so Nigel, coming off the back of Simon's comments and Anna's comments, um, I think what's at the core here is whilst Australia might have some unique problems like our threatened species programs and our reptiles, et cetera. Uh, bioinformatically, we have a lot of shared com common global problems. And that's what working with our international partners is really about, is recognizing that if we're experiencing something, someone else is probably the same. So Simon's just given a little hint about a data movement challenge that we faced here in Australia, getting data in our case from Arnett's cloud store smoothly into Galaxy and from Galaxy back to cloud store. Um, we solved that and we were very proud of our solution, but what we're doubly proud of is that the global Galaxy community saw that solution uh, as a way to enable their data movements from their local infrastructures and it was very quickly onboarded into uh, the Galaxy code base. Um, and if I can take a privilege for 30 seconds more, um, from the service manager point of view, one of the things that uh, in Australia and globally we're always questioning is, is how do we get the word out there about Galaxy? How do we make more people aware of it? 
for, for me, uh, thanks to many people on this call and in the BioCommons, it was about producing a really easily digestible infographic of all the wonderful things Galaxy has done, distributing that in Australia so we could sell our message clearly. But uh, also that infographic has been taken up by our global Galaxy partners and used as a template to tell their own stories so that they can continue to secure funding and provide their services regionally and locally. So, yep, we, we give back, we, we take, and it is a very collaborative experience. Thanks, Gareth. And that, that uh, flows nicely into the final point I'd like to make. We're actually out of time for this session, so I appreciate all of you, that, that, that chat. Um, uh, when we were preparing for this, I said, what should be the closing statement? And, and Simon, I think you said, Galaxy is ace. And the point I want to make is that Galaxy is ace uh, really because of those collaborations and those partnerships, both with formal partners, folks we, we fund to help operate the infrastructure, but also informal partnerships like with uh, the Threatened Species Initiative and Vertebrate Genomes Initiative. Um, and the fact that those partners all have shared ambition is why Galaxy is ace. And the final point I'd like to make before I back to you, Reese, is that um, uh, uh, that we're always welcome for partners, whether that be science partners or infrastructure partners. So if you'd like to come and play in this and making uh, and help us make Galaxy Ace, please get in touch. Back to you. Thank you all. And back to you, Reese. Yes, and I think another highlight we could have mentioned is the COVID work that was done last year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Australia um... participated in the global network of COVID analysis. And uh, do you want to briefly mention, mention that, Karen, what happened? Yeah, so in, in a 30-second bite, um, a number of things happened. There was a global commitment by the Galaxy community to unify and make uh, COVID analysis workflows uh, clear and reproducible. Uh, that came through a connection through the BioCommons and a request to make those workflows available in Australia. Causey and NCI at the same time had their COVID initiative out and we were lucky enough to uh, win an allocation at Causey and deploy uh, specific workflows for global COVID analysis uh, on Australian infrastructure. And that's been running hot since then. Yeah, it's just worth mentioning, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to shift gears as it were and have another example. And I'll ask uh, Stephen and Sarah and Sean to turn their videos on. So Stephen is the Associate Director of Cyber Infrastructure in the Australian BioCommons. Sarah is General Manager of Science Programs at BioPlatforms Australia. And Sean Smith is the Director of the National Computational Infrastructure. And we're gonna have some slides, I think, Stephen. So over to you. Thank you, Reese, um, and welcome to this panel, Sarah um, and Sean, thanks for joining us. So we're here to talk about a program uh, that started a little while ago now um, called ABLES, the Australian Biocommons Leadership Share. And it's all about accelerating the production of community data. Um, next slide, Reese. So the, the idea of ABLES came through, I guess, the coalescence of various um, Biocommons efforts and two key challenges emerged through our um, engagement with communities. Major challenge number one was that through our community engagement, engagement efforts, a consistent theme was that the availability of appropriate and accessible and at scale compute was challenging, wasn't available or was hard to get. Challenge number two is that organized and often uh, national efforts in producing data sets um, or data assets such as the BPA Framework Data Initiatives Program didn't have uh, access to resources to A, actually produce the data and to derive ongoing value from that data. So ABLES was born around working, the idea of ABLES was born around working with researchers to accelerate the production and the ongoing use of these uh, national data assets. Next slide, Reese. This has been touched on in this session and other session, but sessions, but a critical part of the ABLES journey is this idea of evolving and adapting existing compute services to be more attuned to bioinformatics and the way that bioinformaticians work. Um, our engagements with bioinformatics research communities have turned up a whole spectrum of differences in needs in compute and data from what we might consider more traditional um, HPC users. We see these differences emerge across a whole range of facets, and I've just listed four key ones here. 
You know, there are big differences in the skill sets that many of our community members have, where software tools and methods are often inherited from papers or other groups from other places rather than written in house. Um, there are significant differences in access patterns um, where bioinformaticians are often way more episodic in, their, in how they use and engage with infrastructure. Um, the support needs are different um, and safe to say that bioinformatics is often complex, multi-stage, multi-language in nature, and that requires some special and specific types of support. And of course, there are challenges in bioinformatics in defining the idea of an allocation, where, for example, even different species running on the same tool will run in wildly different ways. So next slide, please. Thank you. So there are many unknowns and the idea of ABLES to get started was pretty simple. It's let's just start on a partnership with NCI and PAUSI and ask the question, how do we provide resources to these communities? And that's what we're here to talk about today. And I'll say that a really impactful change and lesson um, that uh, has been, um, that has happened through ABLES is the embedding of ABLES into these communities by participating and directly being part of the bioinformaticians, the steering committees, um, we can really insert the idea of compute and methods into their plants. Um, and we're really now getting into the flow of having these conversations before data starts to even come off instruments. So I'll um, stop talking there. Um, and I'd love to um, now have Sarah and Richmond, have Sarah and Richmond and um, Sean. Um, and have a chat, a collective chat about this. So welcome along. Um, I'll also remind the audience for everyone listening in, please post any questions to the chat and um, we'll, we'll hopefully get to those in the next 10 or 15 minutes. So Sarah, look, I'll start off with you. Um, just a quick one, you know, your role, your responsibilities, and then a follow-up question of, can you tell us a little bit how ABLES is impacting um, the communities that BPA manages? Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so I'm... Sarah Richmond, I'm the General Manager of the Science Program at BioPlatforms Australia. What that means in practice is that I oversee and, and help to develop um, national consortium groups uh, who are, are working towards national challenges across human health, uh, agriculture and primary industries and biodiversity and environment. And the remit of these programs is to create omics data resources of significance so those are kind of foundational data assets that are useful um, for both research government and industry purposes um, and that are useful long beyond the purpose of which they were created for so these are really enduring assets that that um, help to tackle our kind of big science challenges um, in terms of, of some of our active programs that are using ABLES, I know that there was a discussion about this yesterday, so I might repeat a bit of information, but um, in the case of our Genomics for Australian Plants program, which is looking at sequencing um, native Australian plant species, uh, they've been able to use ABLES to uh, create an almost sequence oh sorry, analyze about 2000 different plant species using target capture phylogenomics methods, um, which has been a really crucial process in producing the phase one of the tree of life for Australian angiosperms, which is a really important national asset and, and ABLES will continue to support stage two and stage three of that tree of life program. Um, perhaps most importantly, though, what ABLES has been able to do throughout that process is, is the researchers who are working on those phylogenomics pipelines um, have been able to share those much more easily with other GAP, or that's the uh, acronym for the Genomics of Australian Plants, um, with other GAP users, which is something that hasn't been possible when they've been working on individual institutional infrastructures. So it's really enabled it's almost opened the door to a whole new way of, of at least that community collaborating um, across institutions. Um, another program of ours, the Australian Amphibian and Reptile Genomics Program, or OZARG, uh, they've been using it in quite a similar fashion, both for phylogenomics and creating reference genomes. Um, and it's really enabled that community to hit the ground running. They are already quite a collaborative community, but again, these are national 
consortium programs that have a number of different institutions involved. So being able to provide a, a kind of centralized hub of computing infrastructure for them to collaborate on has been a bit of a game changer. Um, and by doing that, and they're, they're using the, the ABLE service at NCI, um, they've been able to, and I know that both GAP and OZARG are working on a central repository of software and workflows um, that are common among the users, not only within the framework programs, but across both GAP and OZARG. Um, and I think that's had two main impacts. One is um, making sort of the analysis of any future data sets much more quicker and more efficient. And secondly, better enabling the transfer of both system and technical knowledge within and between the framework participants and, and therefore drastically reducing any replication of effort across those programs. Thank you, Sarah, and, and completely agree on the, you know, we have a common home sentiment, um, mm -hmm. something that I hear a lot um, as a as a big benefit of ABLES. Um, Sean, um, so again, question to you about starting off with your role. And, and I guess the, the follow-up question would be, you know, what attracted you or slash NCI to supporting ABLES? Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, so, okay, I'm Sean Smith, uh, Director of the National Computational Infrastructure, which is uh, one of the two uh, national supercomputing and data facilities in the country. We've got ourselves NCI on the ANU campus in Canberra. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre uh, is across in Perth. So, um, as, as has been mentioned already, both Pawsey and NCI are, are engaged with, um, with ABLES, uh, and it's, it's moving along and developing very effectively. I've been, I've, I've been at NCI now for about four years. Uh, came to Canberra in 2018 to take up the role of director there, uh, and and NCI has been on a on a been on a developmental pathway and a journey, I would say. Uh, and and one of our key co-travelers along that pathway is, has been BioCommons, uh, and so for for us as a as a what what has been a heavy duty supercomputing center, the evolution is the evolution into um, managing managing large-scale data sets for for national communities uh, and we got drawn into this initially through the collaborations we have with um the agencies uh, csiro uh, the bureau of meteorology and geoscience australia so in the sort of geospatial data space and in the climate and weather data space uh, we evolved by necessity essentially into the kind of common sandpit where different uh, parts of the ecosystem could come to collaborate Based around those whopping great data sets, um, and and we the, the the journey for us I think has been to understand how together with BioCommons to navigate that a similar sort of pathway, but with di very different uh, usage profiles, uh, and so it's it's very much a learning experience as we adapt and evolve our systems in such a way that they can be. Uh, accessible with different modes of uh, of utilization from the traditional big simulation kind of communities. Um, so I don't want to to dwell too much at this point. Um, we can explore some of those threads as we go on, perhaps, Steve. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, so Sarah, back to you. Um, I guess the question here around there's. Uh, initiatives that are up and coming um, around uh, at BPA over the next few years. So what other kind of initiatives do you think ABLES will be able, will be able to help with and impact and, and service? So we've been working quite a lot recently in um, both in the biodiversity space around completing our work in the vertebrate uh, genome tree of life. So uh, potentially setting up some programs around birds and fish who would really benefit from the lessons learned from OZARG and GAP and, and other programs and, and almost be able to stand on the shoulders of giants in terms of the ABLES infrastructure on, on redeploying the systems that are already being used really successfully. In the agriculture space, um, we've got quite a lot of new programs being established who will be pushing the boundaries, I think, of, of what we've been using infrastructure for in that these are really large scale multi-omics programs that will require a very coordinated and centralized informatics 
um, response to, to creating those data assets. Um, we mentioned it before, but the, these, the framework programs, uh, they really are large collaborative consortiums, which means they're working and processing data at the scale of a consortia um, rather than as, at, at an individual scale. So all future initiatives that are established uh, through, through our framework program having them being able to step into a fit for purpose centralized compute environment where allocation is, is already there, it's sorted out. It was mentioned before that we don't know in advance quite often when data will be coming off sequencing machines and so on. So um, being able to step into that compute environment just means that they'll be able to kind of get on with the science and, and think less about the technology to make it happen. Um, and yeah, ultimately, I think that means we'll, we'll end up being able to get to the end goal much more faster um, and in a much more kind of collaborative fashion. I could just say, Sarah, I was silly enough to ask the threatened species why they couldn't tell when they'd have their data. And they said, well, they're threatened species, you have to go and find them. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't work because you're working with, <laughs> with old specimens or samples. So. That's right. And then you've got to get the sample you actually can use and all that kind yeah. of stuff. It was a silly yeah, question. It's a very iterative process. Thanks, Sarah. And, and Sean, back to you. Um, how, how is NCI seeing life sciences emerge and, and what sort of, I guess, themes or changes are you seeing emerge at NCI because of life sciences? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I think I, I touched um, a little earlier on different modes of utilization. Uh, and, and we've become very conscious that uh, life sciences researchers, they, they, they have a lot of different stuff on their plate. They uh, swing in and need compute urgently at a certain point in their research pathway. They'll engage intensively and then, they, then they've got to go back to the lab and or back to the field and, and do other things for a while. Uh, and so we've, need to, we've needed to look at our entire setup of our architecture and think about ways in which we can make it adaptable to that kind of utilization mode. Um, so we've, we've needed to think about high throughput compute uh, on our systems, uh, on demand access to our systems. And one of the things that, that it's drawn us to do is to build a, a very large cloud, uh, which is not a cloud for its own sake, it's a cloud as an interfacial device to make an easy pathway into the systems for users who don't do it the traditional way. Um, and so high throughput compute and flexibility of access has been a, a really key challenge for us to get our heads around and, and engineer. Thank you, Sean. We will unfortunately have to wrap up the session at that point. Um, that's been a really great conversation. I think we could keep talking about many of these topics for hours. So I want to thank Sarah and Sean for uh, coming and speaking on ABLES and um, back over to you, Reese. Yes, thank you both. That was great. Right, so for the last uh, talk in this session, I've invited Tiff Nelson to come along and have a chat about Apollo. Tiff's uh, one of the people who is employed at Griffith, amazingly enough, and works in the BioCommons. Thank you, Reese. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce you to one of our recent deployments within the Australian BioCommons, the Australian Apollo service, which really exemplifies the benefit of partnerships. Uh, the Australian Apollo service brings together the collaborative genome curation and visualization software Apollo, along with a company support training, um, administration, management and data hosting to the Australian research community. To glean the biological knowledge from the genomic sequencing data, it must be interpreted within the context of other biological information and Apollo allows us to do just that. Um, genome annotation researchers to do that. The service has come about because of a national consultation with a wide group of researchers who undertake genome annotation in Australia. The Apollo software was first developed in the early 2000s as a joint collaboration between the University of California, Berkeley and the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. In 2010, in that decade, it was upgraded to run in a web browser and this upgrade really allowed it to an explosion of research groups to take advantage of its real-time collaboration, curation of genomes and broadened the study of a wide variety of species to improve their genomic features. Many international research groups and organizations have benefited from the Apollo software to support large dispersed genome projects. 
So our goal in community engagement is to understand the researchers' challenges when it comes to digital infrastructure and to empower life scientists to spend more time um, performing their research and less time on the computational infrastructure management. Many researchers from the group we consulted who undertake genome annotation identified the need for mechanisms to easily share their genomes with collaborators and also publicly, to improve their genomes through manual curation annotation with the op option for collaborative curation. They needed software and their data to be easily accessible with a well-resourced working data storage. And there was a strong desire to not have to set up and manage the system. The software Apollo provides users with the ability to collaboratively improve genome annotations that are the product of automated annotation tools or pipelines, but it has an overhead in its deployment and management, which is non-trivial. So from our national consultation with researchers undertaking genome annotation from a wide variety of Australian universities and institutes that you can see represented here in the slide, the software Apollo was identified as a solution by the community of practice. Through the engagement process, we became aware of the challenge identified by a national and broad audience and also the solution to resolve those challenges. Providing the solution of access for researchers to the Apollo software required identification of exactly what was needed to make this happen. Now we understood that the deployment of the Apollo software requires a full technology stack and is not a simple install, along with the requirement of long-term hosting of data, maintenance and security. And in addition to support users, we knew that we would need documentation and resources, including training and workflow processes for onboarding. So with this information in hand and understanding what resources, expertise and skills were needed, we moved to working out how we were going to implement this solution. And for this, we needed partners. So to establish our service, we knew we needed the service planning and management, service development and support, user experience skills, including website creation and bioinformatics skills, along with the user documentation. To support the service and underpin it, we needed computational resources, including a significant working data storage. And to allow the service to support our researchers and our partners, we needed ongoing research on engagement, development of terms of use and related policies. The combination of the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre, QCIF or Queensland Cyber Infrastructure Foundation and the Australian Biocommons did the job. QCIF has a long history of supporting researchers who use bioinformatics in their research and in particular support of genomics. Its interest covers the whole data life cycle applied to omics data. And in this way, they help life sciences and health researchers get the most out of their research data. The Pawsey Supercomputing Supercomputing Research Centre aims to accelerate scientific research for the benefit of the nation across a, a spread of domains, including the life sciences. POSI has made a commitment to supporting a number of national bioinformatics services that are delivered by the Biocommons, such as Galaxy Australia and the Automatic Genome Annotation Pipeline Service, FGENS H. POSI are also spearheading the national initiative of establishing a HPC community of practice for bioinformaticians and have demonstrated their support through the employment of bioinformatics specialists. So Apollo matches the Biocommons goal to support life science research communities with community scale data analysis infrastructure while minimizing that system admin and maintenance overhead that comes with it. So it is our partnerships and joint work that have created the service identified by researchers they need to do their research. To finish this topic, I wanted to highlight a quote from Dr. Don Gores, Director of the QCIF Bioinformatics Branch of QCIF and an integral part of the Apollo Service Development Team. As Don mentions in this quote on the slide, he has seen an increase in the desire for tools like Apollo from the research community. With his team, Dom has had many years of experience in building and maintaining Apollo service for researchers and he recognised the opportunity of being involved in a national service and having a deployment model that can now scale and service a national community. And the result of the Apollo service established through those partnerships is really a win for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tiff. I think the interesting thing about this is you couldn't have imagined yourself doing that two years ago. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> like the part, the bringing of all the partners together, this group of people together, these organisations, then actually made it possible for you to do that. Yeah. Thanks, Tiff. I'm going to have to finish pretty soon, I'm thinking. I can't see the clock. 
So look, uh, the Australian BioCommons, that's a, a, a tiny window into a few of the things we're doing and some of the partnerships that make it possible. We're the place where these partnerships can form and grow to advance Australia's bioinformatics. Uh, and I've been to a lot of training on comms and they say use a few words and keep them simple. I had a memory of what my dad used to say when he fixed things, it's bigger, better, brighter. We've made it bigger, better, brighter. Our partners make the biocommons bigger, better, brighter. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can email us at reset.biocommons.org.au.